Madam President, you can start whenever you're ready. Sure. Good evening. I'm Tony Preckwinkle, and I want to welcome you to this panel discussion and question and answer for the documentary Cooked, Survival by Zip Code. This program is part of our second annual Racial Equity Week, running until tomorrow. I hope you've all had a chance to watch the film in advance of our discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists and our moderator, Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, MacArthur Foundation President John Palfrey, E-Man, I think it's E-Man, I hope so, Executive Director Rami Nashashidi, and the film's director, Judith Helfen. Denise Barreto, the Cook County Director of Equity and Inclusion, will serve as our moderator. During this poignant moment in our history, we're facing three intersecting crises, COVID-19, climate change, and racial inequity. The climate crisis is not only an environmental issue, it's a health issue and it's an equity issue. Let's take a moment to remember the 5,133 Cook County residents who've succumbed to COVID-19 since the pandemic began. I want us to think about the term underlying health conditions, which has become the harbinger of death from COVID-19. The underlying condition that ties these crises together is systemic racism, and we must end it. The 1995 heat wave was a stark reminder that a person's race and zip code were the most critical factors in determining their ability to survive a natural disaster. Underlying these differences in social infrastructure was a long history of racist government policies contributing to segregation, racial inequity, and disinvestment in certain neighborhoods. Areas where the city disinvested in infrastructure, areas that were over-policed, and areas where population had declined and development policies had not filled in gaps in development. Climate change didn't cause these inequities, but it made visible a set of conditions that were always present, but more difficult to perceive. We collectively created the conditions that made it possible for so many residents to die in 1995. And if we are aware of them, we can and should change them. While climate change is a threat to us all, we know that under-resourced communities and communities of color are disproportionately at risk. This is due to existing social, economic, and health vulnerabilities that will only become worse with time. We know that where you live impacts access to healthy food, housing conditions, exposure to flooding, local areas of hotter air, poor air and water quality. Despite decades of warnings, your zip code still determines who is healthy and who lives longer. Communities that experience disproportionate exposure to environmental pollution, such as from burning of fossil fuels, are often communities of color. These communities are more susceptible to chronic respiratory and heart disease, the very conditions that make a person more susceptible to death from COVID-19. This summer, we commemorated the 25th anniversary of the Chicago heat wave with Benel Dorimas, the director of, the producer of Cooked Survival by Zip Code. We will see the same disproportionate impacts on communities of color and that is why Racial Equity Week is so important. We need to move beyond pointing out the disparities and take action to end them. To that end, we've convened panelists from government, philanthropy, and community-centered organizations for our discussion of the documentary. I look forward to an engaging conversation about how we can advance racial equity 
by working together. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Denise Barreto, our moderator, to launch our discussion this evening. Denise? Thank you, Madam President. Welcome everyone. My name is Denise Barreto. I'm the inaugural Director of Equity and Inclusion for Cook County Government, and I am delighted to be with you tonight. What we're about to do is introduce each panelist and let them introduce themselves, and then we will tackle some questions that we have to provoke our thoughts. Um, but we welcome questions from you, and please put them in the chat as we will get to them for sure. Our first panelist is Cook County District 1 Commissioner Brandon Johnson. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Again, um, my name is Brandon Johnson. Uh, for the last year and a half, almost two years now, I've had the distinct uh, honor of serving as the Cook County Commissioner of the First District, which encompasses a good portion of the west side of Chicago, um, Austin neighborhood, Garfield Park, West Humboldt, and uh, the western suburbs. Some of them include Maywood, Bellwood, Broadview, Oak Park, Forest Park. And um, before I became a Cook County Commissioner, I've had the distinct privilege of having the best job possible, and that's of a middle school teacher in Chicago Public Schools. I'm looking forward to today's conversation and uh, hopefully uh, also looking forward to real systemic change um, in order to bring justice and equity uh, for families who have desperately been calling for it for generations. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Our next guest is Rami Nashashevi, the Executive Director of Inner City Muslim Action Network. Rami? Yeah, good evening. Peace and blessings. Salaamu Alaikum to everyone. And um, congratulations to all the Sox fans out there uh, uh, for the, the, the extraordinary moment. I am profoundly grateful and very uh, excited to be part of this conversation. I have been intimately uh, following the evolution of this phenomenal documentary for at least a decade. Uh, and have been engaged with uh, Judith as, as this has emerged. I also, in addition to being the founding executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network that's been incorporated now going into its 22nd year, I was doing community organizing in 1995, running youth programs, remember the heat wave, also ended up getting a PhD in the same department at the University of Chicago that Eric Klenenberg, who wrote the book uh, and did the research uh, heat wave, uh, was um, in and finally, you know, think about this subject then both as an organizer, an academic, and also as a person that sits on a national foundation, the Marguerite Casey Foundation Board of Directors that thinks intensely about these types of uh, issues about uh, racial socioeconomic gaps and tries to fund uh, long-term interventions uh, across the country. So very grateful to be here. Thank you, Rami. Our next guest is the director of the film, Judith Helfen. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much. It's a huge honor to be here. Um, thank you for, the, for doing this work for this week and to this esteemed panel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm truly blessed and privileged to, to get to do this kind of work as a, as a director and a producer, and I've been doing it um, for decades. And, and this film did take well over a decade to make um, on top of that. I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Um, I live in New York City with uh, my six-year-old daughter, Theo, who is taking a bath back there. So I, I hope it's, sorry about that. And um, yeah, well, timing. And um, um, this year, I'm, I have the good fortune to, to start teaching um, at Columbia University at the journalism school. So I divide my time between making films um, and being a mentor to, to many filmmakers, um, to working in the field, um, linking filmmaking to grassroots organizing, um, teaching, and then to using the movies. So tonight is dedicated to um, making sure that we put this film to good use. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And our final guest is John Palfrey, the president of the MacArthur Foundation. John? Denise, thank you. And President Preckwinkle and, and uh, fellow panelists, I'm thrilled to be with you and really grateful to be part of the Racial Equity Week uh, celebration and discussions of these uh, important and hard questions that we face. Uh, MacArthur Foundation is a, a foundation based here in Chicago, and uh, we proudly have been uh, here for more than four decades. We also are an international foundation um, doing funding in places like um, 
Nigeria and India and Mexico where we have offices um, and uh, lots of places in between. Um, we are very proud that we are associated with each of the panelists tonight um, as grantees of MacArthur Foundation uh, Imam, of course, here in Chicago. Um, we were thrilled to be able to support this film and, and its rollout recently, um, and we're thrilled to be a supporter of the county through our, uh, our criminal justice reform efforts um, and very much in step uh, with the efforts of the county. So we're honored to be here. I'm honored to be able to listen in and, and maybe make some uh, re uh, remarks later on. Denise, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So given our racial equity theme, past, present, and future, this documentary is really timely and a meaningful piece of um, content to explore that. I um, want to start off asking, what are the similarities from 1995 in our response to the heat wave of that summer to present day COVID-19 response? And, and what do you see are some of the enduring themes from then to now? And any panelist can start answer. Um, I guess I would say that um, not so much response as origin. You know, mm. this is a country conceived in racism. And the, <laughs> the Constitution of the United States um, describes slaves as three fifths of a human being, not a full human being, um, and uh, enshrined slavery and. So disparities are sort of inherent uh, in our nation. And we see those disparities playing out in the midst of this pandemic in profoundly disturbing ways. Um, I think our, our viewers are aware that the Latinx and African American communities have had significantly higher death rates proportionally than the white community from the pandemic. And of course have been, had greater um, negative results from the economic collapse that's followed as well. Um, more people, uh, more white folks have white collar jobs and therefore can be sheltering in place at home. Uh, whereas black and brown people are disproportionately in essential jobs, you know, grocery store clerks and working in pharmacies and, uh, you know, being healthcare workers and sanitation workers and, and folks who um, have to show up for work every day. And the result, of course, has been a disproportionate impact in terms of people who succumb from the disease and people who are um, struggling with unemployment in these times. So um, we've got some real challenges around race that have been, uh, as, I, as I like to say, uh, laid bare by the pandemic. They were always there, of course, but laid bare by the pandemic. And one of the um, interesting things about this moment in time is that uh, we're struggling with the pandemic and the economic collapse and a uh, bubbling up of um, public protest and concern around racial injustice. Thank you, President. Um, yeah, I would, I would jump in also just to, just to add to that. I, I think um, it, it seems that in some very real ways, every quote unquote natural disaster or uh, these type of phenomena just continue to expose a ever deepening uh, and lay bare the ever deepening socioeconomic racial disparities in a city like Chicago. We have literally, literally over a hundred years now of research, documentation after documentation, study after study, books like American Apartheid that was analyzing this, you know, decades earlier, uh, and yet. What's always, what's most surprising to me is that we seem surprised every time. Um, this last summer, I mean, if, if you wanna look at what has changed, in some ways, those cleavages and disparities just got intensely more profound in many ways. Uh, last summer, uh, in June of 2009, New York University School of Medicine released a study on life expectancy gaps and health disparities in over 500 urban centers across the country and finds, and I should repeat this next slide, that the greatest life expectancy gap in the nation existed in Chicago. The greatest life expectancy gap in the entire country existed in Chicago between the nine miles that separated Streeterville and Inglewood. 
Uh, and, you know, that reality coupled with reports that tell us that from 2000 to 2015, that the rate of people living in extreme poverty in Chicago grew from 300 to 384%. And, and so when we are confronting those stats and uh, then confront the realities of what a pandemic or what a heat wave or any other crisis reveals, um, I think the most, in, in many ways, profoundly hurtful kind of thing for those of us who are, you know, often dealing with the consequences immediately on the ground is that those in power present themselves as surprised by this. When, uh, and so in many ways, the types of outrage right now that is bubbling across the country in our city and many cities um, did not happen overnight. It happened over a period of time. And I think part of it is uh, grappling with the fact that we have not confronted the criminal disinvestment in, uh, in our communities that lead to these types of disproportionate deaths. Thank you, Rami. Judith? Yes, um, yes, thank you. Uh, you know, um, building on that, I mean, I, 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 I think that one of the things that was that was that was important then, but I don't. I'm not sure that people totally under, understood it. But was is absolutely sort of like critical now, um, and people and it's and and if it was not made clear during COVID, it's never going to be made more clear. Is you know is that uh, that you are really as safe as the, the length of your block and 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 as block and as your block is organized. And um, the the first responders and the rapid responders who we have to not just take seriously but truly have to invest in are those who understand and create uh, the, the 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 everyday social networks that are that become you know are critical every single day and even more so you know sort of in the face of and in the wake of and and during you know, a quote unquote disaster. And it's those organizations, you know, like Iman, who are sort of addressing that inequity every single day, not during the heightened disaster, but like every single day, who are then able to mobilize and show up, you know, with the PPP, with the water, with the food, with the trust, um, that, that, that becomes like so essential, that is as essential you know, as, as, as any first responder in so many ways. So, you know, it was in the, it was, that was certainly the case in 1995 that where, 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 where a lot of organizations were able to kind of extend themselves, you know, sort of, or do, do, once they understood what was going on during that heat wave or because they were there, it's, it's clearly that's like, that's been happening in every city in this country and absolutely in Chicago. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, I'm, 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 I think that, you know, one of the major investments that, you know, that has to happen is, you know, is investing in, in those, in, in investing in the kind of social cohesion and those social networks that also double, you know, as, local economic development in very real and very clear ways. Um, so I, I, I think that that has been made really, really clear over and over, but especially right now. Yeah, I, I think the, the question is actually quite appropriate. Um, as someone who is a social studies teacher, uh, being able to make the connections between our struggles today and putting it into some historical context. Um, Denise, I'm gonna expose our age here, but for those of us who are part of the Generation X, the 90s was a very interesting time, right? You have this, um, this just gross crisis where the inequities that exist within our society um, was certainly exposed during this, the so-called heat wave. But if you also remember the 90s, it was the Rodney King beating um, that 
doesn't get the same amount of attention because of the, the, the way he was cast at that time. But when I'm drawing these comparisons uh, to what uh, President Preckwinkle indicated earlier, is that you have the obvious regularly scheduled crisis, which is structural racism. And when you see, you know, like how you know, here we are, you know, years later, that we're still wrestling with many of the same challenges. And in fact, they've gotten actually quite deeper and even more profound, where brutality, um, even when it's recorded, and there's footage of our lynchings that you have a cruel system that continues to ignore our pain. When you have a heat wave um, uh, and you have a global pandemic, you see the impact that that's having on communities like the one my wife and I are raising our children in here on the west side of Chicago and Austin. And so the three things that jump out you know, obviously thinking about the 90s and what it was like in high school to see brutality captured on film while also watching a cruel political system make excuses of why people continue to suffer. Um, those are, unfortunately, some of the parallel that we can draw. But I think what also jumps out is, is how isolating poverty can be. Um, it's something that I don't know if we talk enough about, particularly in a city which is one of the wealthiest places in the world, the city of Chicago, uh, which of course is a good portion, half of, of Cook County, is that in the wealthiest places um, in the world, you have neighborhoods like in the first district, Garfield Park, that it has been described as a developing nation because the violence and poverty per capita mirrors developing countries. And so poverty is quite isolating. I think the other thing that I can draw as a parallel comparison is how, <laughs> interesting enough, how cold-blooded politics can be. You know, the response at the time was, well, it's hot. Like, that was the political response. And you know, the political response that we're seeing too often, particularly at the federal level, um, is just a bunch of nonsense. I think the third thing that I can draw as a comparison, you can tell I'm a teacher because you got to have three points so that we can post questions at the very end. But like the, the how systems ignore reality, realities of black folks, brown folks, marginalized communities. So when George Floyd said he could not breathe. You have had decades of that same sentiment being expressed throughout places like Cook County all over the country. And these systems don't believe us. And it is obviously past time for the realities of what it means to be black, brown, and isolated in America when we say we cannot breathe you still have a system that wants you to prove it. They want you to prove it, or even worse, even worse, they don't want you to react and respond as someone who can't breathe. The system is saying, be still, don't move, relax in the midst of these struggles. And so these are some of the comparisons that I can draw from my experience as a high school student in the 90s and now someone who was raising children. Thank you. I want to turn uh, our, our attention now to, because I feel like you covered the next two questions, so I'm not going to ask them, um, but what is our vision for an equitable recovery from COVID-19 and preparedness? I know it's, it's a big question, but um, I think we all laid bare what was then, now, what we've learned, um, what some of the unique challenges are today. So now I want to turn us to what's our vision for an equitable recovery from COVID-19? I don't mind jumping in on, on, on some of this. And, you know, again, for context, um, 
part of what EMAN does is we are also a federally qualified health center. So we were, you know, de deemed essential workers. So I'm here at EMAN now, and I've probably been here for most of the moment. My wife is at Cook County Hospital, so we, you know, navigating the realities of the crisis on the ground with populations that obviously the black and brown populations in our city that were hit the hardest. And we were very grateful, obviously, for the immediate rapid uh, response funds from various foundations, including MacArthur and Chicago Community Trust and individuals, you know, over 60,000, you know, tons of different foods and, and bags and weekends and COVID testing. We're doing every all of that. Having said that, having said that, including also housing. You know, we work with returning citizens and young men who were, who were getting out of Cook County Jail who needed immediate housing because of the conditions inside some of the districts. And we, were, we, we created convalescence homes. We were responding to all of that. Yeah, and, and, and in doing that, grateful for the philanthropic support and the funders and those who were responding. Meanwhile, the tension though, for those of us on the ground, Rage, Teamwork Inglewood, here in Inglewood, and all those who, you know, every single day we're packing up trucks and, you know, deploying food. But we were also having conversations with Helene, Gail at the Trust, and others in philanthropy as a funder myself who sits on a fund to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistake that is so well chronicled and powerfully uh, demonstrated and cooked. That we wait for these national pandemics, these intense moments of crisis to galvanize resources. And now the Cures Money is an example that, you know, frantically, and we're working with our partners in, 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 in government in Illinois, you know, and we're grateful for that, but people are scrambling to get dollars out before December 30th to be deployed technically, you know, in these interesting ways about treating symptomatic aspects of the uh, of the pandemic while not thinking about what it's going to take for the 5 10 15 20 year marshall plan type of investment that we need in our communities to create the type of social infrastructure that is in fact the real source of what is killing people on top of the pandemic the fact that the summer hit and the young men that were crowded in SROs or family homes that were going from house to house no longer could do that and were out on the streets in larger numbers and did not have safe and adequate housing coupled with the fact that our prison industrial system it was so overcrowded to the point that we were thinking about these pre-releases back into the same zip codes that so much of this crime has happened with no real well thought out plan to not only house but provide jobs, provide connections to the same disinvested neighborhoods that many of these individuals are incarcerated in in the first place. In fact, coming back to neighborhoods that were hit even harder economically with no uh, prospects for job is, is clearly, and we haven't done all the studies yet, but clearly a prime variable in one of the most violent years on record in Chicago history. And so when we start thinking about what this moment is also revealing, I'm, I'm both agitated and inspired and hopeful at the same time. Agitated that yet again, we're in a situation where we're talking about response on a surface level, but hopeful that I do think that those of us that are in philanthropic communities and conversations are finally beginning to hear the fierce urgency of now that we need to I, get to a point where we don't need another 20 years of studies. We don't need another five years of studies to tell us that we need to invest intensely in building up the infrastructure. There's no reason why, for instance, in Inglewood, we're looking at schools that were closed during the last mayor's uh, administration that are still sitting empty, 60,000 square foot facilities next to blocks and blocks of devastated homes that that should not simply be seen as bad, you know, uh, urban planning. It should not simply be seen as a consequence of disinvestment. There should be real, well thought out uh, punishments for that. We should hold people accountable, and we need to move with a level of accountability in this moment. And I'm hoping and praying that the the confluence of political will 
with philanthropic investment that is both responding to the moment, but that is now saying, okay, we need to now both respond, but also allow nonprofits not to simply be conduits for immediate responses, because that type of model uh, is sometimes is reflective of the international agency work that is relief work, which is both very good, but sometimes highly critiqued as only looking to those local agencies for temporary deployment of relief in times of crisis. And when that crisis is gone, those big agencies up and leave without creating infrastructure. So my hope and prayer in this moment is that beyond the immediate rapid response, that we are genuinely committed to the long-term infrastructure investment planning and that we're looking to grassroots partners, not just as conduits for immediate deployment of resources, but as real equitable partners in building and rebuilding our communities for uh, uh, equitable futures that can endure these types of crises in more meaningful ways as they will come, as they will undoubtedly continue to come. Absolutely, thank you, Rami. Wow. Um, amen. I know. I know. <laughs> Tough to follow, go, Judith. No, no, I just, yes, yes, and yes. Thank you. That was so well said. Um, you know, and I, 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 I just, I want to support every word and every, and every breath of that. You know, we, we, we made the film in such a way to, um, we, we wanted the juxtaposition in the movie to kind of scream out and, and support for that um, and call out for that. And um, I want to recognize, you know, we, we documented and followed um, Iman for a long time. And the thing about movies is you can't put in everybody. Like, and I, you know, in a, at the moments when it was like, oh my God, I'm really just, I'm making a film <laughs> about the most extraordinary organizations I've ever seen. And I just like wanted to go all in and, Rami, we have a big hard drive filled with extraordinary material, and it is it is yours. Um, but but that's where I learned the lessons. You know that it is it is these organizations like they they the, the solutions that they have on the ground are the solutions that we have to invest in, um, and they sort of they they get it and they truly understand and i my my hope and my my and what we what we are trying to support with this film and the reason why we kind of isolated the 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 disaster preparedness paradigm and chose that you know as a framework was a it's a framework that i think america really has come to understand and that, i mean and especially now especially tonight and this week but they get it they and they get the irony like, and that's why we're constantly within the film sort of questioning, how do you define disaster? How do you redefine disaster? Well, if we redefine disaster as the long-term impact of, 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 of structural racism that goes back a very long time, then the point at which, you know, the implosion happened, the point at which we have to kind of figure out like, well, where was that disaster and how do we fix that? That's why we include those redlining maps. Now it goes way back, but it's a way to sort of point to where where did this this fissure and 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 where did where did this disaster start and it was it dis, and it started when we decided which communities to divest from and then divest from for generations and generations and generations so we have to reinvest with that with that understanding in mind that the maps are always the same you know may 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 dr whitman's you know, memory be a blessing. It's like, he said it, you know, he said it when we interviewed him and then every other time, it's like that 1995 map, you know, he layered poverty on top of the heat debts for a very specific reason. And it was to be able to like sort of show the blueprint for how to address not just the next disaster, but how to identify the underlying disaster that's there all the time. So, you know, throughout the film we were trying to sort of say like hey you know if if you know 
3,200 people die each year. And, and certainly, you know, that's almost as many people has just died because, in, you know, in Chicago because of COVID. But he was pointing to that number from treatable diseases on the south and west side. Like, that's a big number. The problem is that they die one at a time. They die slowly and they die of diseases that we've come to expect people die of, which we shouldn't because you're not dying of that on the north side. Well, that's a paradigm that every city has. That life expectancy gap, that lifespan gap, that's the disaster. Like we don't have to wait for anything else. And then, you know, when you throw fire on it or water on it or COVID on it, it goes up in flames and we get it. So we have to invest in the institutions that are absolutely committed to addressing that. And they don't always look like healthcare institutions. They look like public schools. They look like libraries. They look like an Amman. They look at the institutions that are addressing inequity um, in, this, in a very real, very creative way that is also very, very often is very green. So like, I feel like, you know, we have those plans that there is that, that Green New Deal. There is a Green New Deal for investing in local infrastructure that turns around and becomes jobs and health insurance um, and helping keep kids in school and transforming, you know, a community and a neighborhood block by block, which, you know, if you borrow from the world of disaster, you know, it's like nobody's coming for you in the next 24 hours you know, it's, it's, you're as good as your block is organized and you're as good as the organizers. So my vision is that, you know, is that, is that level of investment. And, and I think it's also borrowing a page from the world of disaster preparedness and actually looking at, you know, do we need the next new shiny truck or can we literally take some of the money that we might use to invest in disaster preparedness and, in, and invest in the new brand of first responders and the new brand of rapid responders, but do so in their everyday work in the form of general operating principles. Thank you, Judith. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, you know, Madam President, I, I wanted to yield to you, but I, since you pause longer, I, I guess I'll go. Um, but, you know, everything that has been stated is actually quite powerful. And I believe now we're in a position um, as elected officials is to respond with real policy. But there are th three things that I think are important just to kind of highlight um, as we talk about these heat maps, right? If, if you look at these maps and you layer them, it'll, you'll see these are the same communities where schools were closed. These are the same communities where violence um, is absolutely out of control. Um, these are the same communities where unemployment has reached Great Depression era numbers. Uh, so just in my district alone, whether we're talking about Maywood or whether we're talking about Garfield Park, where Maywood has an unemployment rate of 25%, we're talking a quarter of the entire village is unemployed. Um, if you look at Garfield Park, again, uh, we're talking about particularly with young, uh, young voices between the ages of 16 to 24, where unemployment is um, is high as 90% in some of those subgroups. So what we have to do is to make sure that there are policies that actually invest. Um, and as um, we've done at the county level, um, I sponsored and passed a resolution to redirect money um, out of um, incarceration and policing into vital services that I believe will help build lives. And I think to what has already been stated, we have to reimagine what public safety looks like we also have to reimagine how our budgets speak to our values, right? And then the last thing that I'll say is, we also have to be prepared to demand a tax structure that allows for the type of services that we know will help transform communities for a tax structure to be, to be uh, administered in an equitable way as well. That's why we're calling for a fair tax here. Corporations continue to make goo gobs of money while people begin to live, still live in abject poverty. So it's investments, of course, it's redirecting out of these failed racist systems, appropriations that can go towards organizations that are building lives, but it's also demanding that those who have, they have to contribute more. Thank you, Commissioner. Actually, the next question 
commissioner. <laughs> it, it's actually regarding your justice for black lives resolution. Um, you did touch a little bit on some of the policy recommendations, but I'd love for you to share with us a, a little bit more on what that resolution is and what are the things you see and, and how they tie to specifically what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to do this briefly and I'll, I'll use three points again. But I want to, <laughs> the first thing again that I thought was important, many people were asking, you know, how black folks in particular, how we were feeling, lay out our reality. And so in the resolution, the first thing that we do um, is we lay out our reality. That the, the truth of the matter is you have a system of policing and incarceration that is based out of the institution of slavery. Um, the whole design of policing in this country was never designed to serve and protect. It was designed to protect capital. It was designed to protect the interests of those who had power. And of course it was designed, of course, to continue to be used as a tool of violence against marginalized people, particularly black folks. And so it was important that we laid that history out of this resolution. It was also important that we recognize the role that Chicago and Cook County has played in the protection of that failed racist system. So we know the history of how the state's attorney's office was used to brutalize and terrorize and force black men into false confessions. We know that. We know there was a police department that was complicit with the state's attorney to continue to place um, um, not just men and women under arrest, but it, it used its power and authority to terrorize communities that were already suffering from gross inequality, right? And so the language is actually very specific and bold to, to calling that out. But we also lay out in the resolution how Cook County um, has been on the forefront of depopulating the jail. Which, which I'm grateful for the leadership of President Preckwinkle. I've said this and I'll say it again. I think they should put more teachers in charge of systems, specifically social studies and history teachers. And no offense to anyone who's an attorney or business owner, but understanding that historical context is why uh, the president worked with expediency to depopulate. And so now once the language has been established, Let's talk about the things that we agree on. And what we agree on is where investments should go. And so that's, that's, that's housing. And if you look at just in the city of Chicago alone, how the previous administration sat on hundreds of millions of dollars within public housing, these long wait lists where no one gets access, right? And so what did we do as Cook County within suburban Cook to open up opportunities for people to afford to live in Cook County? We know that half of people in Cook County struggle to pay rent every single day. And so we have to make housing affordable. The other area that we're looking at in terms of investment of what this resolution is purposed to do is redirecting money out of this failed racist system of incarceration, not just towards housing, but, but towards health care. So we think about the county care, for instance. In my district, the Loretto Hospital, it's a safety net hospital on the west side of Chicago. 70% of the patients there receive services because of the Affordable Care Act. The vast majority of those patients receive care through county care. But here's the other kicker here, that almost 50% of those that work at the Loretto Hospital, they actually live in Austin. So when we're investing in healthcare, we're also investing in opportunities for people to work. And so that's why I think the other component, and there's eight components there, but the third one that I think is important is workforce development. We have to create opportunities, as our brother said, there are vacant, there's vacant land, there's empty school buildings that could serve as, as trade schools right now for young black brown workers. They could serve as trade schools now. Let's repurpose these buildings to put our people back to work and so that whatever is built in our communities, it's built by us. It's built with, of course, strong union labor positions, which of course has been the economic base for black and brown communities in particular. And so this resolution is something that I believe is important in this moment, because what we don't want, we don't want to fall back to our typical proclivities when it comes to government, where we have this tendency to, to, to respond in increment 
And, and I just don't know how much time people believe we have. Now, the president knows that we got some tough decisions to make, but there is a commitment from many of my colleagues, of course, with the office of the president, to reimagine how our budgets can be administered to invest in those important programs and services that ultimately build lives and not break lives. Amen to the commissioner. I, I just, I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate the leadership of uh, Cook County President uh, Preckwinkle on so many initiatives that have tried over the years to continue to challenge on the policy level to think about what equity can look like. I, and I just want to say both from a, a, a very privileged perspective, again, as a person to sit on foundation boards, but a person that's in kind of the grassroots context, I could, in addition to all of those types of policies, and there are more uh, that we need to continue to fight for around housing, around uh, uh, expanded holistic health wraparound services. Um, I could, some of you may know that, you know, a team of us in Inglewood uh, uh, and, and, and the surrounding neighborhoods partnered for a large proposal that was submitted called Go Green on Racine. Yep. That was a proposal to take a vacant vandalized school in Inglewood, uh, Woods Academy, uh, and in fact, build a holistic wraparound health center, facility for housing, job training out of an abandoned 60,000 square foot facility that sits next to an abandoned Green Line station that was abandoned in 1995 and was never rebuilt, uh, that sits next to uh, dozens of abandoned vacant lots and homes. There's a powerful moment in the Cook documentary, and I've experienced this week after week, sometimes day after day. Uh, and it was when Judith is following residents in Inglewood as they walk around their blocks. Mm -hmm. They must have taken that walk a number of times, but there's something when you take that walk with the camera and as the, mm -hmm. the uh, points out, and, it, and it's one of the most gut-wrenching moments in the documentary for me, I mean, and it's one that I, I really found myself breaking down with because, you know, people have, like the family that's walking with their children, have learned to live with this indignity every single day. And it's not until they stop to point it out that they begin to experience the rage, the trauma, the grief, that every single human being in this country should feel. When we were negotiating recently with the city, I won't mention what official, but when we were sitting on the vacant lot and we were telling him that it's not that we don't believe you want to do something, but your urgency, we don't feel it. We don't feel your urgency. And that's what you don't get. You're putting us through ringers and we've, done, we've raised private capital. We've demonstrated plans, but, but, and you know, we're getting all this kind of, you know, things that protracting. I got 25 young men who are gonna, gonna get caught up in the cycle of violence, who spent two weeks getting up at 6 a.m. in the morning to get certified. We got GCs, black owned GCs that are ready to work on this facility. At one point I asked the question and it wasn't to be facetious and it wasn't to be vindictive and it wasn't a gotcha question. It was an honest, genuine question because the person was trying to assure me and I believe the person is genuine that they're trying to do as much as they can within the policies and regulations and legal. I asked the person, how would you be working on this project if you and your family lived in that house right there? i.e. right across from this facility, i.e. on the same block. And, I, and he didn't answer. I said, and you don't need to answer right now, but I want, I want you to meditate on that. Because I can tell you, I lived on a block with a vacant vandalized home in the South Side. And I know I come hell or high water, I would stay up 24 seven with my neighbors as my kids to make sure that that house did not become a drug home, to make sure that my children because when it comes to our own children, it comes to our own families, we find a miraculous way of cutting through that bureaucratic red tape and making things happen. And then the fundamental existential philosophical question we have to ask ourselves, and the movie asks it for us, 
why are their families less precious, less important than ours? And that's fundamentally beyond the policy. That's the philosophical question, I think, that's in this moment. Why are the families that live in England or live on the West Side less important, less precious, less sacred than our own? And until we really resolve that, and move with the type of urgency we would if it was our own family, cut through the bureaucratic red tape, stay up night and day to raise the 10, $12 million, then I believe we're gonna to continue to struggle and have studies after studies after studies, policies that get us somewhere, but not far enough, because we need urgent, bold intervention in this moment. And I'm praying that the leadership that we do have, because we've never had this type of political leadership for a long time, County and city and government. We have the philanthropic leadership and we have grassroots leadership. In 25 years of doing this work, I have never seen this type of confluence and I'm hopeful, but I'm also scared that sometimes we get too comfortable with those who may sound like us and we don't work as profoundly urgently as we can. And I'm hoping in this moment that we can move across the finish line. Thank you, Rami. Uh, why, don't, why don't I speak a little bit to, um, you know, what the county has done in the midst of this crisis. Um, to Rami's point, um, what's required is, is a focus on equity and not equality. And I try to remind people of the distinction. You know, equality means everybody gets the same and equity means people get what they need. And as we were distributing, for example, our uh, federal resources under the CARES Act, um, we are, we're responsible for sharing resources with suburban municipalities. The city has its own allocation. Um, but we decided that we would distribute the money not on a per capita basis alone, although that was part of the formula. One third of the formula was, was per capita. How many people do you have? But two thirds of the formula was based on a social vulnerability index and impact of the pandemic. So those communities, and it, it was you know disproportionately black and brown communities that were heavily impacted by the pandemic and started out um, you know, struggling in terms of, of socioeconomic uh, characteristics, uh, got, got extra money uh, on that basis. So one third of the allocation was population, but two thirds was where you stood on the social vulnerability index and uh, how hard your community was hit by the pandemic. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, I was an alderman for 20 years and uh, we, had a, we had a very hard time getting resources allocated to black and brown uh, communities. Um, and and to, to Rami's point, you know, it's about who matters. And unfortunately, we live in a country where, you know, black and brown children don't matter in the same way that white children matter. And you can look at that in terms of what gets invested in our schools. And as this was pointed out, uh, I think by Commissioner Johnson, which schools get closed, um, you know, and which communities are food deserts and which communities struggle with, you know, adequate transportation access. I mean, every indicator that you can think of, I, you know, I always say race is a subtext for every challenge that we face in our city and our county, uh, but we rarely have ever acknowledged that. So, if I could just really quick, I think it's, it was important. I'm glad um, President Preckwinkle um, indicated the lens that we're working with. I'll be the first, maybe not the first, but I'll be one of many politicians that will say out loud that we haven't done enough and we need to do more. But I think what's important though, even in the midst of us having the urgency of now, you have to have a model that exists in order for the more to actually take place. So I'm appreciative of President Preckwinkle establishing an equity model so that that model becomes the very lens in which as we get more and as we fight for more, that we make sure that the distribution reflects our values and that if black lives matter, then our budget should speak to that. But having a model, uh, a lens in which we can move resources through is critically important. And I appreciate the president's commitment to that. So in our last five minutes, I would like to um, open up um, John's mic because we uh, purposefully 
wanted John to be listening as a philanthropist and as a funder. And I, we do have a kind of a direct question to him is how do you see philanthropy playing a role in making communities more sustainable and resilient, especially given all that um, you've heard everyone say here tonight? Well, Denise, thank you. And I appreciate the, the uh, amazing comments from everybody. And it's hard not to be moved both by the film and by the uh, sense of urgency and passion of this, this incredible group. So grateful to have had this uh, master class in intersectionality and in the important things that we need to do to address racial inequity uh, in Chicago and, and all the places that we, uh, we care about. Um, uh, I know we only have a couple minutes left, so I won't be long, but uh, so just a couple of things. One, um, Judith, in the film, there are many memorable parts, but the one that keeps resonating for me as we talk is the image of the uh, wonderful guy up on the roof of the um, city hall and showing off the green garden um, and that being you know a two million dollar investment by the the city and then of course you introduce the fact that there are not a lot of green rooftop gardens in uh, the south side um, but thinking just more broadly I think that, that that's an image for me of the fact that we've done good things um, as philanthropy but there's much more we can do and should do um, and of course that um, first and foremost is about putting more money uh, into communities that um, need the funds and need the support and the engagement but it's also about creating opportunity it's about um, having the community at, uh, at the table as we make those uh, decisions in a more participatory way. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which that's true. And um, I, I say that not to criticize uh, ourselves or our, our predecessors in the sense that, look, we gave a grant to Rami, you know, unrestricted money as a fellow to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a good thing. We gave money to Iman, you know, that's a good thing. We gave money to the film. We gave money to the county to do it, to help with this reduction of the, the average daily jail population. And those are good things, but there's much more, of course, that we can do um, and and should do. Uh, and when that's at the intersection, as President Preckwinkle said at the beginning, that intersection of where climate and race and health inequity all come together. And um, just one you know tiny thing I would say to, to other philanthropists, which is that I think the model that we've used in philanthropy has been sort of backwards in a number of ways. One is um, you know when times get tough and your endowments go down, which usually happens, you mm -hmm. tend to give less. And I think the answer is we have to do yeah, double down. Are tough, you got to give more. You have and to so, double down. <laughs> yeah. And Denise, as you may know, we, we did something that no foundation I think has ever done. We raised debt. We borrowed money, $125 million to be able to give out more money this year. Um, and doing that to BIPOC-led uh, uh, community groups, to giving that to um, communities of color. We're giving that to, you know, in ways that we think um, will hopefully make a really big difference. Um, and so I think that, that they're hopefully the, this point about equity rather than equality that President Preckwinkle um, points out is, uh, is something that can guide philanthropy going forward. So much more, of course, for us to learn, but, but I do think that directionally um, we support everything that's been been said tonight and, and pledge to be part of part of a solution. Great and you'll bring some of your other funder friends along. Do our best. <laughs> so uh, before I turn it over to President Preckwinkle um, to give us some closing words I want to thank everyone um, for their contributions tonight on the panel and and in, in let you also know that everything that you've talked about tonight, the Go Green and Racine, like I feel very, I feel like we've threaded this needle all week. We had an environmental town hall on Tuesday night where that came up. We talked to the Fold of Map Project yesterday in Rage and some of the work that we were doing and Go, and go Green came up. So I love, I'm very proud that we have been able to assemble um, a group of discussions that all point to the same answers. And so I am very, very glad to be here and, and be responsible um, for helping us execute that policy roadmap we have with that racial equity lens. And so President Preckwinkle, can you close this out? Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you, Denise, for serving as our moderator and thank our panelists, uh, Commissioner Johnson, uh, Judith, um, John and uh, Rami, I'm grateful to all of you uh, for your willingness to be with us tonight and to share your insights into the challenges that we, we face. Um, you know, this is a, an interesting moment in our history, poignant moment. And, you know, I'm reminded of the, of the ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Well, these are surely interesting times. Um, but I want to thank, again, all of you for your participation and for your thoughtful comments. Um, I really enjoyed, if enjoyed is the right word, um, the documentary. I thought it was fascinating and I want to thank uh, Judith and her team for uh, allowing us to focus on it today, both with our staff and, 
and this broader conversation with the public. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Denise, there's some amazing questions in the chat. You got to see them. Really important stuff. Okay. <laughs> Great job, Denise. Thank you. Nice work, everyone. Very nice. Thank you, Denise. Thank you all. Everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Commissioner Johnson, we got to talk. Our next project is to turn our, to, to make a really good engaged curriculum. Yes. Um, we, we just got a little money to do that. Did I call you?